Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the New Books in East Asian Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Li Pingchen, one of the hosts of the channel. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Michael Kivak about his new book, On Saving Face, A Brief History of Western Appropriation. This book is published by Hong Kong University Press in 2022. In this book, Michael Kivak traces the Western reception of the Chinese concept of phase during the past 200 years, arguing that it has always been linked to 19th century colonialism. Loose phase and safe phase have become so normalized in modern European languages that most users do not even realize that they are of Chinese origin. Phase is an extremely complex and varied notion in all East Asian cultures. It involves proper behavior and the avoidance of conflict, encompassing every aspect of one's place in society as well as one's relationships with other people. One can give phase get face, fight for face, tear up face, and a host of other expressions about face. But when it began to become known to the Western trading community in China beginning in the middle of the 19th century, it was distorted and reduced to two phrases only, lose face and save face, both of which were used to suggest distinctly Western ideas of humiliation, embarrassment, honor, and reputation. The Chinese were judged as a race obsessed with the fear of losing their face, and they constantly resorted to vain attempts to save it in the face of Western correction. Lose face may be an authentic Chinese expression, but save face is different. Save face was actually a Western invention. So this is a brief description about the book. And now let's hear from the author. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. All right. That started with uh, some self-introduction. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your research interest, and anything you would like our audience to know? Yes, sure. I have been uh, teaching at Taiwan University now for 30 years, and I have written a series of books that all concern a similar topic, which is the Western idea of East Asia, or the Western prejudices towards East Asia, especially between the 16th and the 19th centuries. So the study of face comes out of that larger project or longer series of books in which I am trying to examine the ways that Asian cultures are being described and conceived of uh, during this important historical period. This particular book on face, um, because of the nature of the concept, I bring it up to really to contemporary society, even to the 21st century, which is something that I usually hadn't done before, but because of the nature of the book and trying to explain how face has a history in Western languages, it seemed to me unavoidable that I would have to say something about my own culture and contemporary culture. It's usually something that I avoid. I'm more of a historian. I'm interested in origins. I'm interested in Um, development stories and not so much in analyzing or commenting on the 21st century. But this particular book was also more difficult in that it really is a book about a single word or a single concept or a single term. So it required a certain attempt to focus only on that. And so that was uh, a bit of a challenge. How exactly can I pinpoint this without getting into unnecessary details or too many digressions? 
and at the same time providing enough background material for a reader who maybe doesn't know anything about face or doesn't know anything about Asian cultures. So there were a lot of challenges in, in this book, just polemically and conceptually, is how, how to present this material to the Western reader who may only know face through these common contemporary English expressions, lose face and save face. Yeah, it's a quite a balance that how much uh, material that you need to present, how detailed, and at the same time, also the different cultural uh, aspect as well. Right. So this is a book about face, as you mentioned, a term or a concept, but you uh, analyze so many different faces of this face. So uh, we are interested to know um, how you started this uh, project about face or so many different faces about face. Well, I think that the, the subject first became um, noticed. I first noticed it when I began to see people discussing it, particularly in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. The um, most famous commenter on face was an American missionary called Arthur Smith, who spent 50 years in China until his death in the early 1930s. And he was not just one of many missionary, Protestant missionaries living in China, but he really was one of the premier authorities on China and everything Chinese for a general public. And he published in 1890, the first edition of a book called Chinese Characteristics, which became in its second edition in 1894, the most widely read book about China of its time. And this, this he maintained this popularity well into the 1930s. And in Arthur Smith's book, Face has, has a place. And it was really the first time that anyone attempted to describe it as a concept for a Western reader. So for Smith, it was something very important and very elementary. And in the second edition of his book, which I mentioned becomes, this explodes onto the Western scene. And it's something that was, was so widely read he actually makes face into chapter one so that it's not only a concept that was very new to the general reader, but it, it becomes as it were the point of entry into understanding Chinese people. And he calls it the chief Chinese characteristic. And he refers to it even as a key to unlock Chinese behavior or Chinese thinking. So this was, something that really he, he puts into the public eye in this, in this way that it's just the first chapter in the most widely read book about China. It had an immediate effect and a very profound effect. And this term starts to be used and repeated in countless um, books and articles and commentaries about China beginning in the 1890s. And it really, it again, explodes onto the scene. And even by the first decade of the 20th century, it becomes something like a buzzword. And this is something that I didn't know until I started to collect examples of face. I knew that Arthur Smith made it his first chapter. I knew that Arthur Smith was influential, but until I really started to search uh, through the references in databases and, and other materials, I had no idea how quickly it became just an everyday phrase, how quickly it caught the imagination of Westerners during the late and 19th and early 20th centuries. So I became aware of it as an idea. I was attracted to the idea because it seemed to me strange that a Westerner was so interested in face. I wanted to know Arthur Smith's prejudices are very well known. So I wanted to look more carefully at how is he understanding or misunderstanding the concept. That really is what led me initially to the subject. 
But once I really began to do the research, I saw that this, this is so influential and so central to what's happening in uh, the West and its assumptions about China that I, I, I decided that I really need to make a history of this term. I really need to try to figure out what happens and when. I need to go back before Smith to find out who were the first to use it and what were the contexts in which it was used. And then I also needed to um, look at how face was received in the Chinese world once it became so, so common in Western texts. So there were all of these um, points that proceeded after I, or from the fact that I was interested in this concept in, in the 1890s. So it develops step by step and be, ha, became a kind of chronology, which is the way the book is uh, presented now. But there were many, also many surprises and many things that I didn't expect when I actually looked at the history of it. It's, it's important to, to say that it's a kind of shuttling back and forth. It's not just that the West perceives face in a certain way and that's the, that's the end of the story because the West's idea filters back into China and other Asian cultures who then also begin to use face in different ways based on the Western ideas. And there are back translations and responses to what the West has uh, said face is. So it's, it's a very complicated story. And the, the idea of face changes in Asia just as much as it changes in the, in the Western imagination. Yeah, and then I believe we will have more time to kind of unpack how this uh, transition of different ideas, different uh, kind of discourse around this term, around this uh, concept of face, especially this kind of Western uh, uh, perspective and also the uh, European take on this term, this concept. Um, but before that, let's discuss a little bit about what does face mean in Chinese culture or Chinese language in general? So face is English. And then in Chinese, uh, as you mentioned in your book, there's actually two Chinese uh, word corresponding to it. It could be lian or mian. So can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Chinese language context first? Um, yeah, actually there are three main words. There's also yen. Ah, mm, mm. But so that's just to, you know, it's true. I have to try to explain to a Western reader who perhaps doesn't know any Chinese um, how this um, concept is being used and how it's being expressed in Chinese. It's important that it's not only Chinese, but it's in fact in all Asian languages, not just um, the concept, but also the word and words meaning face. I mean, it's just as common in Japanese and Korean, it's used in Malay, in Thai and so on. It, it appears in, in all Asian languages that in some way have had a Chinese philosophical influence. I mean, for the sake of shorthand, I call it Confucian, but that is not really the best term. Um, I call it Confucian just so that it isn't only Chinese. And it's problematic because actually the word face does not appear in the Confucian canon, but as a philosophical concept, the notion of um, appropriate behavior or of living a normal life, of knowing one's place in relationship to other people, all of these things are called face, not in Confucian texts themselves, but in the philosophical tradition that grows out of them, this idea of appropriate behavior at some point begins to be called face. I am not a sinologist, so I don't have the ability to explain when the word face first enters Chinese or other Asian languages. That is not my concern. But I'm trying to explain for the Western reader that it is a, a, a very elemental concept that's really at the heart of socialization in Asian cultures and how this really differs from 
parallel assumptions about the individual and the self and society in the West. It really is something that uh, I do my best to explain, even though it's in many ways beyond me. I am not from an Asian culture. I, I don't have this uh, sort of intuitive, automatic ability to think about face and how it operates. I only have the ability to try to explain it from the outside or to try to explain how it's so different from Western assumptions about the person and the individual. But all I can do is to say that it, it ha it, there is a, a notion of the person as an individual among others, the person as not in any way an independent entity. This is at the heart of Confucian philosophy. And it is totally different from the Western monotheistic tradition in which the basis of existence is one's relationship to a creator God. And that, that's the only relationship that matters in the end, that after you die, you face your maker. And so it's a one-to-one -one conversation, let's put it that way. But in the philosophical traditions of Asia, it's not based on that. It's based on a, a much more communal, from the start, much more elementary communal idea in which the human being is always related to other human beings, not to some God figure. So I, because it's not my field, I'm not really able, I think, to, to explain in a really satisfactory way what face is. It's not something that I'm able to define in any simple way. I'm simply trying to explain that it's very, very distant in many ways from the Western tradition. And that when the West uses the word face or comments upon face, they have to be very careful because it really is something very, very different from um, common assumptions in, uh, from, from Western traditions. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, as you mentioned in uh, Chinese culture and also broadly Sinophone societies and also the East Asian cultures as well, face, this is refer to certain understanding, the collective understanding, if not this assumption about uh, knowing one's place and also in this kind of social network, the reception yes. of oneself by other people and mm -hmm. how uh, this behavior will receive certain response from other people as well. So right. this is a collective um, understanding in how one behaves in certain social network, in certain uh, community, in certain uh, context with other people. Mm -hmm. That's right. So uh, with this, and you mentioned that uh, we talk about this uh, phase from the uh, Chinese Sinophone and also uh, broadly East Asian uh, context. And then uh, now let's talk more about uh, when and how was this concept of phase or specifically the Chinese concept of face brought into Western consciousness. Earlier, you talk a little bit about uh, Arthur Smith and how his uh, books, um, two versions of his book, um, um, introduce and if not popularize this concept of face. But um, so uh, when this, this got started? Well, it's something that Westerners noticed when they came to Asia, and it's something that they begin to quote because they hear it, and they hear it, or they tell us about it. I mean, our evidence of it has to do with Asian people speaking to them. So they're having, the European is having a conversation with someone in Asia who is speaking to them in English or at least the, 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 what that person said is being reported in English. And it is at first a puzzling term to the Westerner because it doesn't make sense. It's face in a certain kind of figurative sense that is not familiar to um, uh, a Western uh, interlocutor. So it's something that um, is at first put in quotation marks, something that's questioned, 
And moreover, something that often appears in some kind of pidgin language. Um, when the Westerners who didn't speak Chinese or other Asian languages are communicating, they have to do so from in some, some makeshift way. And what develops is a Chinese pidgin English in China. Already it's developing in the 18th century. It becomes much more established and actually becomes a language used by great many people in China in the 19th century. And so it's through this, these sorts of pidgin quotations in which Chinese people are, are, are using phrases from Chinese that they're converting into English and create puzzlement to the Westerner. And in fact, face begins to appear in lots of different ways in these texts, not in terms of losing face, but in terms of other variations and other um, subtleties of face. So you begin to see a few people mention it. These, most of these sources are very obscure. They're in diaries or other kinds of journals, some of which were not published or if they were published, were not very well known. But when, as more people begin to have experience in China with Chinese people, then the term begins to uh, have a greater circulation. And it really doesn't become in any way publicly known until the first Opium War, which is a time when the English in this case in, because they're engaged in armed conflict with China, that we begin to have a lot more information about Chinese people, uh, about what is happening on, from a day-to-day -day basis in the Chinese world, more conversations between the sides, more uh, explanations of things for the Western reader and face becomes known um, in this period in a number of interesting ways, not just in descriptions of the society and the people, but significantly in the conclusion of the war itself. Because in 1842, when that war ends, Chinese history changes absolutely hugely. For the first time, uh, many, many things happen. China loses a war, it loses territory, it has to pay war reparations. It has to allow foreigners to live in China year round. It has to allow councils and ambassadors. And it has to develop an, uh, Western ideas of international relations. It has to open a Bureau of International Affairs. I mean, there's so many huge sea changes that occur in 1842. And when the Westerners are trying to describe Chinese diplomacy or Chinese politics, this idea of face suddenly becomes very noticeable to them. It's something that they see, particularly in um, the um, negotiations at the end of the war, the emperor is described as needing to save his face or he's fearing his face being lost. And so a number of reporters who are giving information about the conclusion of this war published in English for the first time in a popular source, this notion of face and how it is very important to Chinese society. So it's something that was noticed even in the 18th century on, on occasion. It's something that um, is used in a variety of ways that puzzle the Westerner. But when the moment comes when there's this confrontation and when the West for the first time is able to dictate to China what it has to do, then face is a feature of this confrontation. And I'm arguing in the book that this is not an accident, that it's uh, very interesting and revealing that face becomes a, a something that was uh, known and something that was broadcast and advertised to the Western world. It was something that Western commentators don't just notice as something curious, but it's something they seize upon. It's something that they attack. It's something that they use against China. It's something that becomes very quickly a symbol of what's wrong with China or a symbol of um, the West's superiority to the Chinese world because the West is, is not mired in 
these ideas of face, which are getting in the way and which are obstructing and which are um, remnants of the past. I mean, there's lots of reasons why they complain. So it happens at a, a moment of a, of a colonial encounter or what becomes a colonial encounter um, at the end of the first opium war. Right, and then especially you mentioned this uh, encounter and also this confrontation with China and then politically and also in terms of tradings and why not, this uh, process of understanding, if not misunderstanding of this concept of uh, faith. And then you also mentioned this uh, encounter as a colonial encounter, this uh, kind of it's a power, uh, uneven power, a relation, power, a structure uh, in the uh, 19th century, uh, especially around and after the first Opium War. So we talk about, you know, 1842, the first Opium War, and earlier you mentioned Arthur Smith's book, 1890 and 1894. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, I'm interested in knowing that how does the Westerner encounter face before 19th century? Because we know that there are missionaries, uh, merchants, and why not? They were actually arriving in China much earlier than 19th century. So yeah. in your book, you was talking about this, uh, 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 the first encounter with the concept of face, or as you so cleverly put it, the preface preface or preface to face. So can you tell us a little bit more about before the 19th century? Yeah, that was a bit of a surprise to me. I, well, this is one of the things that I wanted to look at in, in the course of the book, which is that if face becomes something that's um, noticed and described and seized upon, especially in the middle of the 19th century, and yes, there were a few people who mentioned it in the 18th century, but the question is, why do none of the earlier missionaries ever mention it? I have never found any quotation, any text that uses that word, never. And I know a lot of material about earlier missionary activities. I mean, my previous books have, have discussed this material many times. And so going back to look at it again in doing the research for this book, I, I was very puzzled why does no missionary mention this? It's something that's so central to all Asian cultures. It's something that you would assume that the missionaries would hear every day. I mean, it's so basic to the language. And many of these missionaries were, were very well versed in, in variety of Asian dialects and they spoke the language every day. So why is it that it's never mentioned? And so going back to look at the material, what I realized is that actually face as a concept is being discussed all the time. It's just that the word itself is not being used. Western missionaries were constantly noticing and commenting upon behavior and codes of behavior and different sorts of behavioral um, manifestations in the cultures they were describing. In the case of China, the overwhelming cliche from the start was something like civility or courtesy or politeness. Chinese politeness and many, many words in different languages and in Latin and so on being used to describe these behavioral codes. This was an obsession, in fact, of missionaries from the beginning. And every missionary book or text spend some time describing, quote, politeness or courtesy or other um, rituals, social rituals. So they were really actually obsessed with it, talking about it constantly, but for some reason, they don't use the word face. It's something that I cannot explain. I don't really have a specific reason why face was never mentioned. There are things that come close. It's just that the word doesn't appear. The nearest that we come is that the, in the early 18th century, when um, a missionary called Duhald uh, wrote this gigantic uh, four volume 
encyclopedia of basically everything that was known about Chinese up until the 1730s, which is when he published this book. And, and it was for the 18th century, the encyclopedia that was the most widely read. And it was published originally in French, and then it was translated into English on two different occasions. And it appears in other languages in different uh, forms as well. It's a tremendously influential text in the, throughout the 18th century. When he comes to describing um, politeness or the Chinese characters, the chapter in which it appears, he talks about how Chinese people are interested in appearance, in guarding the appearance of things. And it's an important aspect that comes out of the missionary tradition is that people who notice these codes of politeness or these rituals of courtesy, they also criticize them. They describe them often in a very neutral way in which they're just saying, this is how China is, or this is how the Japanese are. But at the same time, because they're approaching it from a missionary perspective, they're obsessed with the idea that it's, it's wrong. You're wasting time on pointless things. You shouldn't be too worried about spending time on social rituals. It's, it's a misguided morality, or it's something that, that needs to be changed when you become Christian and so on. So that there is this built-in um, distaste for it at the same time that they're so fascinated by it when they describe it. And so it's this negative aspect that feeds into a negativity that is also in place when face is actually mentioned in the 19th century. So the missionaries are very important for um, setting into motion what will happen in the 19th century once face itself, the word is being used. But in the missionary era that ends at the first opium war, so this first era of missionary contact. In China specifically, there are two different eras. There's a vaguely, generally Catholic era and a generally Protestant era in the 19th century, although there's a lot of overlap. But when this second era of missionary activity takes place, and Arthur Smith is a symbol of that, then it is being affected by these opinions about society and Chinese character that were put into place in the 17th and 18th centuries. But indeed it is, remains a mystery to me why you never see the word face in, a, in the previous period. The only way that I can answer that is to say, what's more important is why it's used in the 19th century. I don't think it's really um, profitable for us to wonder too much why the word doesn't appear earlier. I'm more concerned is why it's articulated in the 19th. I mean, what is the motivation? Where does it, what is the usefulness of it for 19th century commenters? That seems to me to be the real center of, of the problem. Yeah, and then as you mentioned, and also uh, tell us that even though the term or the word face is not specifically or particularly mentioned in earlier documents or so, but uh, it's uh, there, the concept is there. And then yes. this kind of like, uh, for the lack of a better term, this kind of discursive investment from the West to this concept. As you mentioned, there's kind of this building, this take, uh, this building a disdained or, or this kind of negative attitude, there's already a judgment from the yeah. West to see, oh, how this Chinese concept of faith is structuring or if not impeding the uh, Chinese society. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, and then uh, earlier, you also mentioned that, you know, uh, in the uh, first Opium War, and then there's some document about the emperor is trying to, quote unquote, save face. So this term is used, as you mentioned, also analyzed so brilliantly in the book uh, from the 19th century. 
uh, especially uh, after the 1842. But um, also in your book, uh, you, there's a, a lot of different phrases, different expression about face. But after the mid 19th century or around that time, it seems that in the Western uh, interest or their investment in this term seems to be ossified in two particular phrase. And one is a loose phase and one is safe phase. Right. So what's so, I mean, attractive about face? And then why is this so attractive uh, term but actually narrowed down into two uh, phrases only? Well, I think the most important thing to understand about this book is that the book is called Saving Face or On Saving Face, not Face. The real center of this book is the phrase Save Face. That is really the most important thing. I mean, if, if I want readers to know one thing from this book, it is this, that Save Face is not Chinese. As it is used by Westerners, it is not Chinese. When I first saw that and realized that, it was an, uh, a, a, an earth-shaking revelation because I had no idea. I thought I'm going to write a book about face in which I'm going to give comparative perspectives or history of how the term is used and who uses it. But then when I realized that in fact, say face isn't even Chinese, but it is something that is really invented by Western commenters, the whole structure of the book completely changed. And my whole understanding of this bifurcation of lose face versus save face became clear. What the West is doing is that initially it is simply repeating a two word phrase, which is authentically Chinese, lose face. It's ungrammatical in English, because you can't say lose face. You have to have a pronoun at least, and you can't lose your face. I mean, it's impossible. So what it's doing is it's, it, it's, it's recording a pidgin English expression like long time no see or no can do or other examples. And it's, it's bringing them into English word for word without any modification. And this is an authentic borrowing, an authentic repetition. It's also used often in a very negative way. I mean, the fact that it remains ungrammatical captures a certain understanding of Chinese people's language. It's as if you're making fun of Chinese people by saying that. And the same is true when you say to someone long time no see, you're, you're playfully replicating as it were, this elemental, elemental qualities of Chinese. It's almost like Tarzan language or something or caveman language without inflection and without grammar. So when the West imports this phrase, they're repeating it and to some degree making fun of it, but bringing it into a Western idiom in order to explain Chinese behavior. But that's not all they do. They also turn it on its head and they invent this opposite, so-called opposite, which is saving face. And in fact, in European languages, save face is far more popular, far more common. It's far more lexicalized into Western idioms. It really is the invention. It really is what, what becomes new and what is changed once it enters Western discourse. You have to understand that it's the idea of safe face as the Westerner expresses it is really a perversion of its original meaning in Chinese or other Asian languages. It's to this idea that you are so worried about losing your face that you will do anything to save it. But the way that face works in Asian cultures, it's not like that at all. That's not how face is conceived. 
Faith is not something that you scramble to recover or that you scrounge around trying to find a way to keep. That is not how faith operates in Asian cultures. That is the Western biased view about how faith is operating. It's very, very complicated. It's something that I, I'm not able to articulate in one or two sentences. Really, the book as a whole is hoping that the reader will patiently go through these chapters and understand why this is the case, why it is that safe face as it's used in English and other Western languages is totally wrong. It's, it, has, it has nothing to do with the way face is used in traditional Asian languages. But that's such a difficult point. And then um, in your book, you actually have uh, many different examples or so to sort of uh, build the case how safe face is actually a Western invention. As you mentioned, with the traces of pidgin English expression, but also at the same time seem to kind of making fun or to sort of uh, uh, bring certain uh, attitude uh, toward China and also uh, Chinese culture as well. Right. So uh, with that, um, it's not just an invention. It's not just a popular expression. As you argue in your book, this uh, appropriation of faith actually was used and functioned as a colonial tool, especially for, uh, after the mid 19th century, this encounter and also increasing confrontation between the West and also uh, China as well. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the saving face as a colonial tool or who were among the first one to actually use this phrase or invented phrase? Well, it's another effect of Arthur Smith, really, um, if you want to find a certain kind of origin. I mean, the number of times you can actually find that phrase, save face, the number of times you can find it before the 1890s is extremely small. It's just a handful of times. So it's something that um, does not really come out of 1842, but something that comes of, from a slightly later period having to do with um, the end of the Qing dynasty and the um, different kinds of confrontations that occur at the end of the 19th century, the war between China and Japan and so on. I mean, there are lots of um, um, moments in the late 19th century, but in terms of the uh, sudden appearance of this phrase, it really doesn't happen before the 1890s. I don't have, uh, a one sentence explanation of why it should be only in the 1890s rather than a little bit earlier or a little bit later, I can only say that it becomes clear that specifically the phrase save face is very, very useful to the Western commenter. It's a very useful way of establishing a hierarchy in which China is at the bottom. It's a very useful way of complaining about Chinese society, a very useful way of, of arguing for the superiority of Western assumptions. It really functions uh, as a tool in so many interesting ways because it is a, as I mentioned just a moment ago, a kind of perversion of the workings of face within um, an Asian context. A lot of this is part of the difficulty, and I just want to point this out briefly, is that in English, the word save is actually rather complicated. And save has two different meanings. One is to preserve something, and the other is something like trying to recover it or to make up for it. And so when the phrase save face is used in Western languages, you actually have both of these shades of meaning, but only one of them is authentically Asian. And that is the idea of preservation. It is indeed the case that the workings of face entail that something needs to be preserved, that some kind of equilibrium needs to be maintained on all sides, not just yourself and your own 
self-respect or your own humiliation or your own embarrassment, but everyone, the everyone involved in this transaction, whatever it is. And it can also be very um, metaphorical. It could be the face of your nation or the face of your entire family or something. It's maintaining and preserving something that has not happened. You are trying to prevent something from occurring to maintain um, this equilibrium, I think is the best word, to maintain that lack of conflict. And so when some Westerners, for example, Arthur Smith himself, when he uses the phrase save face, even though he should know that it isn't really a Chinese phrase, when he does use it, he's using it in the sense of preserving something. And even though the phrase doesn't really appear in traditional Chinese, that idea of preservation is, is correct and accurate. But what happens is that the word save in its ambiguity creates a situation in which one kind of saving becomes another kind of saving, which is not authentic. The idea of preserving something is turned into this idea that something has already happened and you're desperately trying to escape it. You've already made some mistake and you are doing whatever you can to scramble to get it back or to, to somehow preserve yourself from being humiliated. This is not the way face works in Asian cultures. In, in Asia, face is something that hasn't happened or something that is not known. But when you say saving face in the more common Western sense of trying to escape from something or trying to cover your tracks or trying to paper over something that happened, this post factum quality is totally un-Chinese and totally un-Asian. Face doesn't even make sense when you are thinking about those kinds of situations. So safe face becomes this other Western negative reading. And because of the difficulty of the word save, it's kind of sliding from one sense into the other sense. <coughs> Excuse me. It's yeah, sliding. And, Go mm. on. Yeah, and then um, to to think about this um, late uh, middle and also late nineteenth century, it's a very uh, interesting time, especially for modern East Asian uh, history as well. Right. And then, as you mentioned, you know the uh, China faces different challenges and also crises. Uh, also uh, certain um, mistakes they make in terms of diplomatics and why not. This shifts of the regional order. So it used to be this kind of Sinocentric, China as a center, China is the uh, dominant power. Whereas in the 19th century, especially mid and late 19th century, it's a different story after right. the encounter with the West and confrontation with the West. And then, so I'm thinking about this is, as you mentioned, the West reading of how China is dealing with this crisis. And then they are describing this situation with this invented term or this, um, um, their own uh, understanding, if not misunderstanding of face. And then to describe this whole reaction as safe, face. And right. then, yeah, so I think definitely um, uh, uh, agree with you to think about how this term safe face is a way to establish a hierarchy. So it's an mm -hmm. uneven power relationships with China and the West. And then, you know, there's already certain uh, competition dominance where China is considered as at the bottom or as inferior uh, to the West. Yes, that's a very good uh, summary. And that's uh, perhaps why it's being described as, uh, quote unquote, a saving face. Uh, China is uh, trying to saving face in front of uh, the West. Yes. And that's so, true. That, mm -hmm. That's happening very, very powerfully uh, in a number of events in the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. Right. And then so we talk about the uh, 
concept of phase and also the different readings of phase and then also the term safe phase. So we talk about 18th century, 19th century, but now we're moving on to a period where there is no longer Qing Dynasty. It's right. a new China, a modern China. So one of your chapters actually look at this new China and especially how modern Chinese writers such as Lu Xun and Lin Yutang, they right. uh, respond and how they talk about faith and saving mm -hmm. faith. So can you tell us about how uh, the modern Chinese writers respond to uh, this concept or this invented term? Yeah, they certainly are responding. I mean, another complication in this book is the fact that I mentioned so many times safe face is a Western invention and that it doesn't appear in Chinese. In fact, it does appear in modern Chinese and other Asian languages. And this idea of saving as scrambling to recover and all of that, that, that is used all the time in modern Chinese. And it's something that I am not able to do, I think very convincingly, is to try to describe how that is actually a kind of response to what is happening in the West, how that, how that usage of face and actually a phrase, save face, which does appear in modern Chinese, how that is really an effect of the popularity of that phrase in the West. I was, I'm not really able to prove that or to show that absolutely. What I am able to do though, <coughs> is to look at some of the ways in which face is being noticed in early Republican Chinese texts. I was able to do this mainly through newspaper databases and other shortcuts like that by doing searches for um, phrases that could be translated as save face in Chinese. What I discovered um, from just a, even the most cursory searching, if you just plug into these databases, something like save face in Chinese, and there are lots of possible variations in modern Chinese, what you discover is that maybe 90% of them are translations from a Western language, that it will be a newspaper story taken from the London Times or a news wire service like the Associated Press that is being translated into Chinese. And at first I thought, well, doesn't this just prove my point? Isn't this just so easy now? All I have to do is explain to the reader when you do find safe face in early 20th century Chinese texts is mainly just a translation. Actually, the situation is not that simple because by doing more careful searching and reading around in, in early 20th century um, texts, you find that they're discussing face very, very often. And in these same newspapers, if you don't just search safe face, but you just search face, and you really try to see how face is this, a subject of discussion, you see that there's tremendous numbers of commentaries in early Republican sources, like newspapers. Commentaries about face as a concept, criticisms of face as a holdover from the Qing dynasty or something old fashioned, or criticism about how face is actually a wonderful concept that's been debased by modern life. And they have these very, very general titles like just face or speaking of face or the face question or the face problem. So that there's a tremendous amount of discussion that's also going on in Chinese texts about face. And the, with many, in many cases, responses to the Western popularity, because these writers knew very well that this, the term, not just save face, but face in general, is something that Westerners are constantly uh, repeating or studying or accusing China of. So that in, in the Chinese world, there are a variety of responses to um, this popularity, including a lot of criticism, 
a lot of writers like Lu Xun, for example, he, he, he says the West, Westerners don't even know what they're talking about. They think that if they just understand this concept face, they'll understand Chinese people, but they don't even know what face is. So there's this important way in which the Western popularity is coming back into China. Chinese writers are rethinking face themselves, commenting upon what's happening in the West. And then also beginning to use um, face expressions in a, in a certain way after the fashion of the way it's using being used in the West. So you have a lot of Chinese writers who do start using save face, even though it's not um, a phrase from traditional Chinese. It's a kind of newly coined phrase in Chinese too. And it becomes very useful to Chinese writers as well. Who are criticizing the government or who are criticizing the um, old Qing dynasty um, um, rules or codes. I mean, so that this is why the, the, the story becomes so interesting and complicated as a shuttling back and forth and a, 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 the two sides in a way using each other, commenting on each other. And it leads to a situation in, in contemporary modern Chinese in which safe face is also present in the Western sense. It's not just that it's Westerners who know nothing who are uh, criticizing China, but it's also Chinese people, in this case, Chinese reformers most of the time, who are also saying the same thing and using the phrase in the same way. Yeah, I think it's uh, very fascinating to especially think about in modern China and especially Republican era, how face and also the term safe face, mm -hmm. there's also this um, um, degree of criticism and it could be for many different trajectories to criticizing the Qing, the residual of the quote unquote tradition right. notion or right. this criticism of how West misunderstood face and right. use the term safe face, but there's also another layer of criticism about the Republican government, their Definitely. governance, their policy or so. So um, so for me, it's very interesting um, twist and turn as the uh, now no longer a dynasty, China now is the Republican uh, polity, but thinking about how, uh, as you analyze in the book too, how Chinese writers that they uh, approach, they understand, and also they use the term, uh, also this concept as well. And then um, in so many different uh, trajectories as well. Right, it's absolutely the case. It was a very difficult chapter for me um, because I'm not a Chinese specialist and you know I had no choice in here, but I, I have to do some kind of analysis of Chinese material. I have to use Chinese texts. I have to claim some kind of authority that I have in, in being able to figure out what they're doing and so on. So it was a big challenge for me. Uh, and I approached it with a certain amount of trepidation in, in how to present this material. I mean, actually there were two chapters in, or sections of the book that, that analyzed Chinese language material. And I'm actually very uh, proud of both of those sections because I think they turned out very well. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And then especially when we think about this uh, period, this uh, new China Republican period and the uh, May 4th intellectuals, right. and they are striving for a modernization of China, either culturally or in terms of literature as well. And then and then to promote this new cultural movement. And then, so I think maybe this is one of the reasons why they are um, you know, interesting to talk about face, whether as uh, yes. maybe this, as you mentioned, this kind of Confucius uh, code of ethics, the code of behavior, or as uh, you know, this certain uh, Western appropriation or misappropriation of the Chinese uh, concept. Right, exactly. I mean, the, the, in the Republican period, they, many of these writers had just as many complaints as the Westerners did. But of course, the complaints were not exactly the same. 
but, but yes, so that save face can also be used by the Chinese side for its own purposes. Right, there is different uh, uh, usage, or now we have a different layer of this uh, term, uh, safe face. And um, so this is around um, 1920s or so, the Republican period, but there's also another interesting term of face, and this time, is in the 1950s. And as you analyze in your book, this concept of phase actually was uh, becoming a subject to for study. And in terms of social interactions or so, right. um, can you tell us a little bit more about how phase is now as a subject of study and then also in the uh, different social interaction from the 50s? Well, in fact, uh, in terms of the word face as a, as a term in um, Western languages, it's an extremely central term in many social science fields, um, sociology, anthropology, and so on. And so I thought I needed to add this section at the end of the book, even though I consider it almost in some way like an appendix I thought I had to add this information because maybe um, a lot of readers will, this will be the first thing they think of when they think of the word face. I mean, people who work in social sciences will have heard this word, and this is something that they may associate with the word more than its Asian origins or more than um, the way it is used in Asian cultures. So I thought that I needed to include a chapter on this development. And it is chronologically a little bit later because it doesn't happen until the 50s um, and later. It's a term that was adopted by some sociologists as um, a kind of heuristic term to describe social interaction in general. It was perceived that in order to theoretically explain how people interact with each other, maybe this idea and this word face would be useful. And the first one to borrow this phrase does so in, in this very peculiar way where he cites the Chinese tradition, <coughs> but he doesn't really discuss it in a Chinese way. He's just borrowing it in this very strange and vague way. And it does, because he is a very influential sociologist, it's, it's a term that is being used from time to time or being noticed and cited and quoted, but it doesn't really develop into any kind of general theory. It's just that the man called Erving Goffman, Goffman he, um, it was so influential in his time that it really enters the language of social, science, the social sciences during this period. But then the real um, impetus for how it becomes a fixture of a lot of social science happens a little bit later when it gets picked up by some sociolinguists who are trying to develop a kind of formula, even a mathematical formula to explain social behavior. And they pick up Goffman's term face, and they make it a very central term in their book. But by this time, it has absolutely nothing to do with Asia. There's nothing to do with China. It doesn't make any difference what the origin of that word is. It's, it's for these linguists, just this, this abstract term, which they think will explain in a theoretical way how social interaction occurs. And they do this in as if it were some universal term. But of course, it's one final step, you could argue, in the sort of appropriation of face, right? It's just, uh, in fact, uh, another stage in something that's been going on for a long time, which is the way that face is being taken out of or away from its origin and used for other purposes in different ways. So it's still a term that you see very often in certain social sciences. And I thought that this would be 
a fitting conclusion, at least chronologically, for the arguments of the book. But uh, if you are not someone who is working in social science, maybe you're not even aware that face is a common term in uh, sociology, for instance. But because it was such an important uh, and interesting development, I, I included it as a very short final chapter in the book. And then following that, there's just a, a, a short commentary about how face and safe face are being used today. Very, very cursory, just doing uh, some, giving some examples from contemporary uh, news reports and so on. And just to show that it's become really so watered down now that it, it, it can be used as a criticism or a description of Asia, but it doesn't have to be. It's something so general, it's something so abstract that anyone at any time can be interested in saving face or anyone, any culture, someone who's never heard of or has no awareness of its Asian origins can still use the word to describe some kind of general behavior. Right. And then, so uh, this is uh, becoming a subject of study in the sociology, but as you mentioned in contemporary, like everyday uh, context as well, we still use the concept of face, or sometimes we hear safe face here and there as well. And another thing I'm also thinking about uh, as I'm preparing this uh, conversation is um, Facebook, right? And then this, oh. even though it's totally different uh, dimension uh, from what you analyze, but I think it's interesting to think about when we think about quote unquote phase as this uh, codal ethic in certain social interaction. Mm -hmm. And now we have Facebook, this is the virtual interaction in social media. <laughs> so right. I think it's kind of this kind of very interesting, or I should say another twist of term of phase or um, how this this term or this concept is uh, here and there in our everyday life, even though I totally agree with you, it becomes so general and mm -hmm. if not abstract to refer to individual behavior in a community. Yeah, I mean, I if someone wants to write about face uh, and Facebook, that would be great. I mean, it would be another book. <laughs> yeah, maybe that I'm interest, interested in. I, I'm not a social media person, but that is something absolutely that that could be a new chapter. Absolutely. No, that's just uh, part of what I um, think about <laughs> when uh, I was uh, reflecting on uh, different uh, great <laughs> arguments and great analysis uh, from uh, this book. So we talk about different phases of face as you analyze in this book. And now we are moving toward to the final portion of our conversation today. Okay. So uh, after this book, um, what's your uh, next project or um, what are you working on right now? Well, I'm thinking about something that grows out of this book uh, quite easily, um, but it's I haven't really decided yet whether to embark on it uh, as a book, it's, which is a history of the word Chinaman, which was a, uh, uh, has become a, a racial slur. And today is a very, very offensive word. But this word Chinaman, um, again, just like face, is, is a word that was used for different purposes, right? And for uh, different reasons. But the history of that word is actually extremely interesting. Its origins and its many meanings and how it was not only a slur or something that was used um, to belittle Chinese people, but it, was, it, it had become so normalized that it was actually the, the supposedly the neutral word for person from China. And it remained a completely neutral word for many, many decades or even centuries. So I'm considering uh, doing a history, uh, you know, uh, chronological history of that word and, and its fate. Yeah, definitely sounds a fascinating project. And then uh, given my research interest also involving uh, the uh, 
diaspora, especially in a trans-Pacific context. So when you say about the term China man, immediately I think about Maxine Hong Kinston's book, China Man. And oh. then even though it might be uh, not necessarily dealing with the uh, term or the uh, the historical usage of the China man, but thinking mm -hmm. about in the Asian or specifically Chinese American context is uh, what I immediately think about when I hear your uh, fascinating next project. Yeah, it will, it's, a, it's a tough, uh, I don't know exactly where the, this, will, this will go yet, but uh, I, and what will be the, uh, you know, what I will touch upon and what I won't. I don't know yet, but I'm just intrigued by it. And I and something that also intrigued me is that um, in order to understand the word Chinaman, you first have to understand the word China. And actually mm -hmm. the word China is extremely complicated too. Right. <laughs> something I'm reading about now and uh, it, the history of, of why the West calls China, China is a very, very interesting story. I don't know that that would be the subject for an entire book. Um, I don't know if there's enough material about that, but the but but I'm extremely interested now in the word China and the name China. Yeah, definitely, and especially uh, China in the Chinese language is Zhongguo, or the literal translation is Middle Kingdom. Mm -hmm. But how does that from Middle Kingdom to China? So right. definitely a very interesting um, um, transition or the history that definitely need to be unpacked. So, I mean, if I don't write about Chinaman for some reason, maybe I'll just write about China, but I don't know if there's enough for a whole book. Well, maybe you can have two books, one about China oh. and the other Chinaman. <laughs> yeah, maybe, that, that, that's, uh, maybe that's what will happen. Well, we'll see. I have to start writing it. I'm, I'm, I'm simply compiling and reading around at the moment, but at the moment, I'm I'm just completely fascinated with the name China. is such an interesting story. Right, and so we look forward to uh, your book and also your future uh, project as well. So uh, this um, concludes our conversation today. And uh, Michael, I want to thank you for being on the show today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Mm -hmm. That was my pleasure. Uh, this is not the first time I've appeared on New Books Network. I think it's a, a wonderful venue for bringing uh, new research to the public. So I'm always happy to participate. All right. And I also want to thank you, our audience, to uh, stay till the end. And I hope everybody's taking good care and see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>